I've been working on this campaign, Operation Recovery for Service Members' Right to Heal. Um, we came together as an organization and we wanted to stop having demonstrations where everybody spent all of their time and resources and came together um, for one day and then went off and nothing changed and we didn't feel um, supported. So we decided we wanted to start building strategic campaigns um, where we could take chunks off of our uh, mission and goals, which are immediate withdrawal from all occupying uh, forces from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, full medical benefits for all returning service members, regardless of their discharge status, and reparations for the people of Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, you know, those are huge, huge missions, huge goals. Um, and it was really hard to figure out how we could come together and organize in a way that was actually going to be making change um, and, and making progress towards our goals. So uh, we came together as an organization um, and we decided that we wanted to work on Operation Recovery for Service Members' Right to Heal. Um, we knew that too many people, soldiers, were being deployed um, overseas on psychotropic medications. Um, they were being deployed uh, with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis, uh, with military sexual trauma, um, and with traumatic brain injuries. And so we decided as an organization uh, that we were going to take this on, uh, and we've been working for three years now on this campaign uh, to stop the deployment of traumatized troops. So um, this tour is the Right to Heal tour. Um, myself. Um, along with probably about 10 to 12 other individuals who have taken part in this organizing drive at Fort Hood um, are traveling around the country to tell people about our efforts and to try and get um, support in that. So that's why I'm here. I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't done this much of the program by myself and I haven't had such a nice turnout. So um, I'm going to just shake it off a little bit and, and get back on track. Yeah. So um, starting out, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, the history of the GI movement, of um, GIs working for um, their rights, and also a little bit about the history of um, the traumatic effects of war. And so um, we know that, that people have been suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder um, called one thing or another since uh, civilization began, since wars began, uh, whether it's called soldier's heart or shell shock or, um, you know, the 10,000 mile stare, all these different things, um, all come back to the fact that war is trauma. War itself um, is causing these injuries in people. And so when we think about uh, organizing for our rights, it's really important to look back at the example um, of the Vietnam veterans against the war and how they came together um, in the late 60s and they were coming to make their own care, make their own way um, to heal because they were not getting the care that they needed from the government. And so um, learning from people who are now our mentors that um, back in the 60s and 70s they were organizing to have post-traumatic stress disorder um, actually recognized as a diagnosis. So those are the kind of people who um, we're looking to for a mentorship um, on how we can come together, stand together, uh, feel our own power as, as humans, uh, despite the fact that we signed up to be in the military, um, to own the fact that we are still humans with um, consciences, consciences um, with, with the power of choice, um, and that we should have some say in um, what we're asked to do um, overseas and in foreign countries and how we're asked to um, carry out these wars. Um, I myself am a survivor of military sexual trauma. Um, I was raped shortly after I returned from Iraq while I was in the military and um, I, never, I never reported it. I never spoke out about it. I never told anyone um, that it had happened to me because of the stigma um, that is around uh, sexual injuries, sexual trauma, um, and psychological injuries in the military. Um, I was a strong woman. I was good at my job. I was strong. I, I was good at PT. I had soldiers under me. Um, and I had believed the lies that were told to me in the past that um, women who come forward 
and say that they were sexually assaulted are liars, they're, um, they're sluts, they're trying to ruin someone's career, they're trying to get someone in trouble. And all of those things weighed on me as I, as I thought about what to do. And I couldn't come to grips with myself as a survivor um, or someone who had been sexually assaulted because I thought, no, that only happens to, to women who put themselves in bad situations or women who um, dress a certain way or act a certain way. So in coming to this organization and coming together with other people who wanted to work on this campaign who said, you know, no, it's not just post-traumatic stress disorder, it's not just traumatic brain injury, but our women are being traumatized every day by the men that they serve with as well. So it was people like that coming together for this campaign that made me realize myself that I, I had to come out um, and own this and own the fact that I'm a survivor um, and be willing to speak about it and shed light on this issue and um, take shame away from this issue because it doesn't define who I am and I didn't do anything to deserve it, yet it happened to me because it happens to one out of three women in the military. Um, so those are some of the reasons why we've thought it, it's so important for us to come together uh, for this campaign. Um, as an organization, we chose to focus on Fort Hood, Texas, uh, where some of the worst mental health crises um, are happening in the military. There was the shootings with um, Major Hassan, who was a, a military mental health specialist, and he, um, he turned and, and killed 13 or 16 soldiers at Fort Hood. Um, in 2010, when we mobilized to Fort Hood, uh, they had the by far the worst um, record for s military suicides, the military wide. Um, they had 22 active duty military suicides on Fort Hood, where the next highest military base had 11. So they had um, twice as many suicides as the number two post. Um, so that's the reason why we went to Fort Hood. Um, and since we've been there, since last May when we got there, um, we've been asking General Campbell, who's the military commander at Fort Hood, to meet with us, um, to talk about the issues that soldiers there are facing, and to talk about solutions that we can come up with together um, to improve the access to mental health care for soldiers there. Um, and what we've been demanding is that service members have a right to heal. They have a right to um, medical care from medical professionals and not military commanders um, and that they have a right to exit the situation that traumatized them. So when we say uh, service members have a right to care from medical professional professionals and not military commanders, that's because medical professionals can say this soldier is injured, this soldier has post-traumatic stress disorder, this soldier has a traumatic brain injury, they should not be deployed. Yet a military commander has the authority to say, no, we need this troop over there, he's going anyways. And they're telling soldiers at Fort Hood, no, just deploy and you can get care in Kuwait. So if you can't get care on a military installation in the US, what makes anybody think you're gonna get adequate care in Kuwait in a combat zone? It's not gonna happen. Um, yet, military commanders are interested in um, meeting their numbers and having their troop readiness um, and getting promotions, so it continues to happen. So, despite all this at Fort Hood, um, you know, we asked General Campbell to meet with us. He refused time and time again. Um, and so last Memorial Day, we mobilized to Fort Hood and we put up a guard tower outside the gates of Fort Hood that said, General Campbell, you're on watch for military suicides. And we stood outside the gates and we talked to soldiers that were going in and out and we passed out purple ribbons for them to wear um, for Operation Recovery and in memory of all uh, military suicides and um, psychological injuries. Um, and we've, we've been talking to soldiers at Fort Hood since then, um, san since last Memorial Day. We've been going out um, and collecting surveys. We've been asking soldiers to sign on to our pledge saying that service members um, have a right to heal and that uh, traumatized troops should not be deployed. Uh, we've been conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews with soldiers at Fort Hood to find out what exactly are the issues there. Um, what are the barriers to care there? 
And we've been finding out a lot that um, the programs are there, but they're just not able to access them because of the stigma, because of the lack of leadership. And so in learning that, um, we've also uncovered some of General Campbell's own policies at Fort Hood. Um, he says that medical profiles that doctors give to soldiers saying they have limitations um, to their service, those should not be seen as suggestions, that they should be seen as the law, that those um, doctors should have the final say in the care of the soldiers. Yet it's not happening, yet profiles are still um, being violated. General Campbell has a, a policy that says um, supervisors should not uh, be a barrier to soldiers getting care, that anyone engaging in stigmatizing activity um, will be punished under the, the military law. Yet it's not happening. Yet soldiers are still told, um, suck it up, drink water, um, you know, don't be a pansy or whatever worse things than that um, people are told in the military. And so, you know, soldiers still are unable um, to access care. They still don't have a right to heal. And so that's why we're down there um, working at Fort Hood. And it's not just um, service members at Fort Hood, and it's not just soldiers that are still serving, but it was important for us to go down there and have a win. It was important for us to take a chunk off of this um, military mechanism that, that's just controlling the soldiers and making them feel like they have absolutely no say in their own lives. And so um, that's why we've been there trying to empower soldiers to stand up for their own rights. Um, we can't do anything to hand um, service members their rights if they're not going to claim them. So it's really, um, we work on what's called transformative organizing, um, where we try to lift up the, the leadership of the soldiers, the affected community, um, stand up for their own rights to decide um, how and when they're going to engage with General Campbell and that's what they've done down there and they've said um, You know, we want General Campbell to enforce his own policies We want to show all of these examples of when he's not following his own policies And so that's where we are right now um, after this year of collecting testimony um, Meeting soldiers hearing about their problems um, We're at this point again with uh, will General Campbell meet with us? And in this past year, uh, one of the things we've been pushing for is to have a town hall meeting, and we actually won that this past January. We had um, a Facebook town hall meeting, so it's not exactly what we wanted, but it was a chance for service members to um, air their <coughs> complaints and to get answers from General Campbell about them. And a lot of his answers around uh, stigma and the care of soldiers uh, he referred back to these policies that I mentioned that say um, profiles are to be followed and that there should be no stigmatizing um, activities. Yet our research, our popular research there, shows us that that's not true, that that's not happening. And so this is the phase that we're in um, of our campaign right now, is exposing the fact that uh, General Campbell has not followed his own policies and soldiers at Fort Hood don't even know about those policies, so they're unable to stand up for their rights because they don't know their rights. And so what we're asking for with this letter and with our effort towards uh, General Campbell right now is that he hold a safety stand down. I'm gonna grab my water real quick. I need a little drink, I should have brought it. Does anyone have any questions so far? No, I'm kinda zooming through it. Yes ma'am. Why did you originally join the Army? Yeah, um, I joined when I was 19 years old. Um, I wasn't ready to go to college. I felt like I just finished 12 years of school and I didn't want to jump right into it. And so um, it seemed like a adventure, um, something different to do. And it was, two, it was March of 2001. So, um, you know, I wasn't expecting to, to jump right off to war either. Um, so yeah, that's why I joined. What rank did you have and what did you do in the Army? I was a signal sergeant. I uh, I did satellite communication, phones, and internet. Yes, ma'am. Did you, were you working with a group of people that you knew, like the person who attacked you, was it a group within your hometown, or, I mean, I, I understand that now, when I went to the military, everybody was so different from different places. Yeah. I understand now they're deploying soldiers, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not really sure, deploying soldiers within their own 
based, I guess this is like, you know, National Guard. Yeah, like I mean, it, I don't want to talk too much about the specifics of my case, but it was somebody that I knew, and, and that is um, most often the case, is that um, people are victimized by, by folks that they know, folks they serve along with, and yeah. a lot of times people who have um, power over the victim, so a lot of times um, people who are, you know, superior to them as well. Yeah, I, I, and I appreciate I wasn't trying to get into your circumstances, but I just think it's interesting. I mean, when you mentioned it, I wondered if, you know, that would make it more difficult if the person, you know, if, if anybody in a situation like this, um, I was harassed, it wasn't right for me like that. And, and, I, and I told the CEO about it, and, and the guy came up and said, you're gonna get me a lot of trouble. So when you said what you said, it just mm -hmm. rang a bell. And, but I didn't know this person from anybody before I went to that base, and he would, if not from my hometown, there would be no interaction. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm wondering if that's part of the stigma for, for people today. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's the, um, anytime there's an incident like that, it, it brings a lot of heat on the unit. So, um, you know, anybody who might, you know, get someone else in trouble is seen as, as breaking up. Um, unit cohesion or being a troublemaker or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, th there's just a lot of really severely ingrained sexism as well. And it's, you know, to, to be um, a leader or a successful woman in the military, even you have to be sexist against women is, is the bad thing because um, I know I myself was. I know, like I said, I believed all the lies that were being told about women because you have to. Uh, differentiate yourself and say, you know, like women are treated so badly, but I'm not like the rest of the women. I'm a different kind of woman. And that's what women who are in leadership roles do instead of um, being supportive and lifting up other women and standing together. Uh, that doesn't happen in the military, you know, which is another reason why um, I never spoke out because you don't have support um, from, from the women. You, you don't have um, the same kind of bonds, I think, that a lot of the guys in, in the units have, which is unfortunate. Were you redeployed? Were you in Iraq? Were you redeployed? Yeah, I, uh, I deployed twice. I deployed three times. Once was to Kuwait before the war on a training exercise that was the exact same place we uh, invaded the next year. And then I, I went to Iraq twice, once with the invasion in 2003, and then I went back in uh, 2005. Um, but besides my own issues, while we've been at Fort Hood, um, there's been people who have come in there and um, before coming into our community and being able to talk about um, the stigma they were facing or the lack of care that they were facing, they were suicidal, they didn't know what to do. Um, and having a community where people could actually tell the truth, be honest, let it out, um, talk about it is such a, a huge um, healing thing for people. I can't really explain it enough how much the truth really does set you free and having a place where you're free to express that is absolutely priceless to members of the military. Um, and we in Iraq Veterans Against the War just lost this $50,000 grant that we've been getting for years because now the war in Iraq is over. Yeah, every day we get tons of new members because it's not during the conflict when people are realizing they have mental health issues or they're psychologically injured. It's months or even years after the injury where people are ready to face it. And that's another problem with care in the VA. Less than 50% of eligible soldiers or veterans are even enrolled in the VA system because it's so broken. It's so re-traumatizing to go through that broken system that people are happier just to ignore it, to self-medicate, to drink, get into drugs, um, or if they're lucky, find a community of veterans who support each other, create healing spaces together, um, and see what we can do about this as a community. So, yes? Uh, 60 Minutes has had a couple good segments about the Iraqi war veterans. They had um, a segment a couple months ago about head trauma and the suicides mm -hmm. and then last night they had a, a good segment on about people coming back losing two to three limbs and mm -hmm. they interviewed a lot of these men, uh, mostly men, 
who had lost two legs and one arm. I didn't you know, see that about all last the night, but... You know, the 60 Minutes has really done a pretty good job on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've seen cases like these murders that happened in Afghanistan, and that person had been deployed three times. Um, it, it hasn't been made um, exactly clear in public um, if he had an official diagnosis, but um, the, the rumors were flying that he was diagnosed with PTSD, that he was on psychotropic drugs. Um, so, you know, that's brought a lot of light to this issue, but it's not the kind of attention that we're celebrating, because what a tragedy tragedy. Um, but that's happening to, to lesser extent, left and right. Um, drug and alcohol abuse are skyrocketing. Um, domestic violence is skyrocketing. Um, so all of these problems are not just in the military, but they're coming back to our communities. Um, they're coming back to our universities. They're coming back to uh, these hometowns that the soldiers left. Um, so it is really a, a issue that c should concern all of us um, and not just veterans and service members. Um.